Thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about Drupal Commerce, the innovative open source e-commerce platform. It's gone by a few taglines, but I think innovative is one of the best, better ones. Um, real quick about me and Bluehorn Digital. Bluehorn Digital is a Drupal, we're Drupal and e-commerce consultants that deliver your web application needs. Um, so we build and deliver your projects from architecture design to development to maintenance. Right now, Bluehorn Digital is just me. Um, I started out in November after leaving Centaro. Um, all in good terms, a lot of it was just to do some more impact locally in my town and kind of build more development talent here. So let's talk about Drupal Commerce and I wanna go through some of like the high level capabilities because I know we have some folks here have never used Drupal Commerce or maybe they used it for Drupal 7. Maybe they're still like, I'm gonna use Ubercart because I wanna be Uber, you know, and it, all that, uh, we'll go through some of that. So one of the big items that I think makes Drupal Commerce very powerful is out of the box, it has multi-tenancy. And by multi-tenancy, all it means is you can have multiple things in one, in, um, one instance. Um, for all the Drupal users, think of the domain module, how the domain module lets you have multi-site without actually using the multi-site capabilities that you can segment content based on domain names. Well, Drupal Commerce has that with stores. You can have multiple stores within one website. Um, I didn't bring you the example in here, but Oomph Inc. did Lyco Geosystems. And they set up like Lyco Geosystems. There's a case study on Drupal.org. They have different websites per country and then a different store per country. So there's the Italian store, there's the UK store, there's the Canadian store, or maybe it's just like UK, maybe the, the North American stores like the Canadians and United States. Um, and all that is one Drupal site that uses stores to have you know, 10 different shops within one domain. Um, and stores can be resolved using custom code. For all of the headless projects I've been on, we actually use a custom header to say, oh, it's the Norwegian store or it's the Danish store. Um, you can use it by setting cookies. Beef Jerky Outlet does that where you click shop my store, goes there. So it is home outlet. Um, you set a cookie and then the site knows like, oh, you're shopping this store. So look up pricing, availability, et cetera, through that store's lens. Um, and that's a really powerful feature. Um, and piggyback on, on that allows us to have multi-currency. So every store gets its own currency that it uses. So if you have one shop, you can sell in euros. But if you've got that UK store, you can sell in British pounds um, and all of that. And, you know, U.S. dollars, Canadian dollars. And each store ties to its own currency. You cannot do mixed currency orders. Um, the site actually will throw an error if you try to do that. And the idea is that that would only happen locally when developing. So we kind of feel loud and clear. So that way, you know, you have a bug in your logic. Um, and also headless commerce. So this is like the new space. This is honestly where I've lived for the past three years is headless Drupal and building headless commerce. And what's really interesting is headless commerce people think it's like this really abstract idea. It's just, it, sorry, not abstract idea, but they're maybe not sure like how they would use it. One reason that we've brought a lot of things into like the headless space is for performance, because it doesn't matter what you're, what you're doing. Rendering is the most expensive operation in any software application. That's why server side rendering is becoming big in JavaScript. You know, rendering in the client is expensive. Um, and Drupal's render system is no different. It's the most expensive part of it. So by decoupling, you can actually make the site faster, scale more, but also embed your storefront into multiple um, displays, such as a kiosk. Tesla uses Drupal, and I'm fairly certain some of the content in those Tesla screens is from a Drupal site. Now, there, as far as I know, there's no Drupal commerce in it, but to give a more gen generic example. So this would let you build like the mobile app that talks to Drupal Commerce site or, you know, laptop, etc. cetera. Um, there's the whole B2B, B2C and C2C, which is business to business, business to consumer, and then consumer to consumer. Drupal Commerce allows you to empower all these different purchasing personas into one site um, via different checkout flows, different order types. So, one example is the Sport Obermeyer project that has a business to business where retailers can purchase things in wholesale, but also business to consumer where regular folks like you and I can buy stuff directly from the manufacturer. And using different checkout flows and price lists, 
they're able to say, oh, well, you're a wholesaler, you receive this discounted price, and you go through a checkout experience that is tailored to you to collect wholesaler information. But a regular customer just sees the normal checkout like you'd see on Shopify, where it's like get your shipping information, your billing information, and go out. Um, so regardless how you sell or what you sell, you're able to build a tailored experience to your customers that meets your business needs. And of course, you can build a quote unquote regular store. All these things, mo most sites, a lot of a lot of stores don't necessarily need those features, but they help the companies meet their goals. Um, but a regular store may not need these things. So you can still build like a standard store, but what all this gives you is the flexibility to innovate, scale, and grow. A lot of times I see people using Drupal Commerce, they have a standard store, but there's that one thing, like they're a scientific rent, tech, like uh, they sell scientific tools and they rent them. Well, you can't rent things in most platforms. Um, or they're selling in, um, they're selling bacteria cultures in decimal quantities. You can't really do that in some other platforms, but they were able to take Drupal Commerce and their regular store, but make it match those little quirks in their business model and off to the races they go. Because let's face it, every single business is a technology business with some other focus. And the way you win is through technology. And I think we've been, at least I know I've been seeing a lot of the analogies about people who start like landscaping companies. How do they win? They actually use Facebook Messenger and modern technologies instead of faxes and phone calls. So that's where Drupal Commerce can help you excel by adapting to your business so that way you can have the technological competitive edge. So those are like some of the high level silos of features. And now I'm gonna go into some of the like top level categories like products because that's kind of core to the whole system. So Commerce has a scalable and flexible product modeling system where you have a product and think of that as a container because that product has variations. And sometimes this can get confusing when people are like, well, what's a product, what's a variation? If you sell a shirt, like this is a maroon shirt, but then you had blue and red, well, it's not magically one product that shifts colors when you need it to. You have a palette in your warehouse that says, here's my maroon shirts, here's my red shirts, Here's my blue shirts. But then you also have them in different sizes. So somebody who goes to your warehouse and picks the different size and color options, that's a variation. So think as a product, as a container, and then your variations are there is those individual SKUs. Like when somebody goes and ships your product, the variation is that specific thing that was shipped out. And variations are identified by their different product attributes. Common, let's say size and color, or it could just be size because the product only comes in one color design like shoes. Usually shoes, it's just the variation is the size. Um, and when we want to talk about scalable and flexible product modeling, there is a Drupal Commerce site. This is the, the last updated number. Last time I knew it was 16 million SKUs, but they did a live query on the database and there's 20 million, 699,713 SKUs in that site. And they have price lists. So every price has unique pricing per organization because it has B2B and B2C pricing on it. So it scales out. And I really wanna highlight this part too, because a lot of the SaaS software that you use has artificial limits built in for monetization. Um, like, don't quote me on it because I know it's I, the numbers wrong, but let's say Shopify says you can only have 1,000 products. After you have 1,000 products, you have to start paying them X amount of money per month to get more. And, you know, like, like any software as a service, you need to find these limitations to generate revenue. But that can be one thing where all of a sudden Shopify becomes too expensive because you've exceeded their, their quote unquote limitations, but their, their monetization barriers. So that's where it can be more affordable to build your platform and maintain it than vendor lock in. And there's other services out there, but Shopify is like the most comparable because it is really easy to get going, but really easy to get locked in and realize you're spending a lot of money per month. So I'm just going to share some screenshots of what it's like to like this, like the product setup. 
So we have our product attributes in here. You see we have color and size. You can go into the attribute, edit it and say how you want it to render. So you could have a select list radio buttons or do rendered attribute. And as you can see, we have blue and we're actually using the color field module. So that way it renders the color blue. So you can go in, add all your colors and then the specific hex code. Um, since it is Drupal and you can own the code, I've actually seen sites where their true attributes are like cosmic pink and rainbow red. And then they build like a synonym system that maps to another display part. So something like that's not necessarily out of the box, but you're not limited. You're, you're still able to build that in since it is Drupal entities and fields. You can create a layer on top to support that kind of setup. And when you go to a product and you manage the variations, we give you a little table. Um, titles are automatically generated based off of the attributes and you can have the SKUs using the auto SKU module do the same. So you can have it say, okay, I want everything to have this code and then dash the attribute name. And each variation has its own price. You can publish and unpublish variations. Um, one, one reason you would do this is uh, you might, you know, let's say you have a product that's on closeout and you don't want to unpublish it completely, but you know that once you sell out of the green small shirts, they're never coming back. So you'll unpublish it. So it doesn't show up. Um, and here's the rendered page. As, you, as I said, we're using the rendered color attribute. So it shows up as a little square. There's no coding you have to do here. This is actually something that just works out of the box when you just click it all together. And when you change the color, it will select that variation and allows you to show custom images. So green actually can show like the green pictures and blue shows the blue pictures. And this is done because when you add content, the product variation should contain all the data that's unique to that SKU, such as its price, the attributes, any of the photographs. So a lot of times if you have different colors, it has its own unique photos that need to go along with it and along the shipping weight. Now that's what would go here, but anything that's merchandising should go into the product container. And for those who aren't familiar with like what it means by merchandising, that's what you'd call the body field where it's organized in the catalog, um, any special like categorizations or tagging, stuff that's used for like SEO or just general organizing. Think of it like the old school way of like when you merchandise a product on your shelf and like the end caps, like that, how is it displayed? So the product would contain the body text, um, you know, your path alias and how people reach it, the catalog terms and the special categories. And to segue into that, let's talk about catalogs. There is no standard catalog functionality. Uh, there isn't like a catalog module. Um, Centaro has built one and it is part of their Centaro Commerce SaaS that they're running. And I know, I believe it's eventually going to be spun out, but it's kind of going through this like incubation period as their customers run on Centaro Commerce. It gets formulated and then spun out into um, a contributed project. But for most things, you just build your own because all the tools are available. Um, that's why there really isn't a catalog module because it's, there's all the tools already exist. You just use the taxonomy module in Drupal core create a view on that taxonomy and quote unquote, to dot, you now have a product catalog. You have a listing of content in Drupal. We have Drupal is really good at displaying content. It's a content management system. So these tools already exist. And with Drupal, we have the search API module. And by leveraging the search API module, you can index your products into a search index, either the database, solar, elastic search, and use those to create a faceted search experience. So that way you can say, oh, I wanna browse by these certain categories and then the individual attributes while under like the men's category. We have promotions. And the promotion systems is something that has me really excited um, because we did a lot of competitive analysis against other platforms and Shopify has a Sometimes simple is good and Shopify does have a really good and simple promotions system, but we've received feedback from folks who use Salesforce Commerce Cloud and they love like they, they actually really enjoy our permission, our promotion system over that, which I take as a pretty good compliment. 
Um, so promotions and coupons are available out of the box. If we're coming from D7 land, those lived in the Contrib ecosystem, but we made sure to bring it into Drupal Commerce Core itself for Drupal 8 or the 2.x branch, so that way it could be um, have like some first class love. Uh, promotions can be time-based, usage-based, or activated by a coupon. So a coupon is not separate from a promotion. Think of a coupon as an activation criteria for a promotion. Um, coupons can also have usages and time-based restrictions. And there's a bunch of conditions that can be used to determine if a promotion is active. So you can go into your promotions and see a list of the promotions that are active in your site, the usage, um, if it's limited per customer, per customer limit is tied to either the logged in user or the email address attached to the order. Um, so like everything, it could be gamed if they created like custom email addresses. Um, it can also have a start date and an end date. So if you have a, you know, a common example is Black Friday, right? Black Friday, everything's 30% off. Well, you could add that promotion a month ahead of time and say it starts on whatever date, time, you know, at midnight of the day of, and it turns off at 11.59 that night, and just walk away. Well, you know, you wouldn't actually walk away because you'd be monitoring your site, but you know the promotion would just work. Um, so when you edit a promotion, you can give it a name. That's the admin label. You can customize how it shows up to the end user. In this example, we have a buy one, get one promotion. So when it shows up in the subtotal and says that there's a discount, instead of just saying discount, blah, 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 it'll actually say BOGO. So that way they understand that discount is from the BOGO discount. Um, you can limit it to the different order types. And this example only has one store, but if you had multiple stores, you could limit promotions to a specific store. Um, so like, for example, Black Friday, I know it's kind of become like an international sales phen phenomenon. But if you wanted to limit it to just the US and Canadian stores, you could do that and save Europe for like Cyber Monday or something of that sort. And when you go to coupons, you're able to add coupons individually, or you can actually bulk generate coupons. Um, we had in, uh, a site where they would um, use coupons as a, what do you wanna call it? As like a, oops, sorry, we screwed up for customer support purposes. So they would just go into their promotion and they would bulk generate one use coupons and then give that coupon code to users. So whenever they ran out of coupons, they would just have to go bulk generate some more and then they had more like, hey, sorry, here's a $10 off coupon for individual customers. So when you go in and edit a coupon, you can set the code, if it's enabled or disabled, the total available, and how many per customer. So you can say that this is one thing that's interesting. If you had a special deal, you could say that there's 100 coupons and a customer can only use it once. So if you had a the first 100 customers, that's how you would set this up. Is you could say the first 100 customers use this coupon, get blah, blah, blah. Set total available to 100 and only one use per customer. And for pricing, for more advanced pricing, we actually have price lists that are available. And price lists support dynamic pricing across products. Um, the most common use case is for B2B, where in business to business, your wholesalers, different organizations get different pricing based on the amount of sales volume, negotiating contracts. So when somebody logs in, and let's say it's a, by role or some other logic, you can say that they get this pricing set. Um, you can have a price list start on a certain start and end date. So to go back to Black Friday pricing, let's say the entire store isn't 30% off, but there's certain products that have different percentages off. Instead of configuring all these promotions, you could just create a price list that runs during that day and adjust the prices for your customers. Um, it can be used to manage prices in bulk for your products. This is how a lot of multi-store sites do this, is they just use price lists and say, I have my UK price list, my US price list, Etc. and so forth. And when somebody's browsing that store, that price list is what's active. So when you edit a variation that has that price field, that's kind of like just the fallback, just in case there's a lot uh, a gap in logic. So when you add a price list, you can set the name, the eligibility. So it could be a price list for just specific users. 
um, based on roles, the start date, end date, and again, this example only has one store. You can say it's for specific stores. Um, you go in and you add prices either individually or you can import prices from a CSV. And you can also export the existing prices or use it as like the base template. So this way you can manage all of your pricing via CSV. Um, you could have your backend ERP system generate it and then upload it manually or come up with a way to sync to automate that process where um, I was on a project and at 5 a.m. Every morning we synchronized all the products and then imported all of their pricing. And that's how the prices were set for the day. So we'll talk a bit about taxes because taxes are fun and they're the easiest part of e-commerce. They're not, they're actually, well, they're not the easiest if you live in the United States. If you live in Canada, the EU, Norway or, or Swiss, and I'm pretty sure we have Australia, it's really easy because we have plugins for all the value added tax. So if you live in either of those countries that has a value added tax system where it's dictated by laws and it changes at specific dates, you just add that plugin and configure it and you're great. Um, if you live in the United States, we allow you to have custom tax definitions. So you can say that my um, tax, I know that my tax nexus is, is in Wisconsin and that's the only place I need to collect sales tax for. You could, you could set that up. Um, if I, I highly recommend anybody, they talk to their CPA or lawyer to know this because it's changed a lot. And you should use an integration like Avalara or TaxJar. Um, I specifically call it Avalara because they've been a great partner to the Drupal Commerce um, project and have done a lot of co-marketing and funding for things. So. Um, Avalara is a great solution. So if you did live, like if you want to add a tax type, you would go to taxes, click add tax type, and you'd pick from the option. And if you're in Canada, you just click Canadian sales tax. And based on any, if anybody is buying from Canada, it will resolve their proper tax rate. Um, if you're setting up taxes for the United States, you can create different territory conditions. So our demo, the Drupal Commerce demo ships with a Greenville, South Carolina tax. So if you live, if you enter a zip code within Greenville, South Carolina, you will get a 6% sales tax attached. Um, the reason like this can work if you want it to, but if you live in areas like I believe Washington and even Colorado, they tax per county and I don't know if anybody's ever looked at a zip code map against county lines, and it's not like they line up. Um, at any conference that Everlayer is at, they usually have this TV screen that shows a map of tax lines, and they're all over the place. So you usually wanna use some kind of tax service. Um, and I stress this just because you don't wanna be liable for, for any like miscollected taxes. And we even link to something now in the tax module. So when you go to a Drupal Commerce site and you go to taxes, um, as part of the partnership with Avalara, there's now a way to like take your tax assessment or get a free trial with Avalara. Um, so you can go ahead and dive into that to, um, to try them out and see like what you might be missing possibly. And that's actually what I had for the slides. I was gonna run through um, any I was gonna go through an actual Drupal Commerce site um, for it to walk through a few things if anybody had specific questions. Since a lot of this could be, I figured a lot of this would be um, some Q and A. So did anybody have questions up front or I can just go through some of the parts that I didn't have in the slides. Let's go through some, some more of the things that I discussed but didn't really have slides for. So inside commerce, we also have um, the shipping module. Um, I don't have US, we have contrib modules for um, DHL, FedEx, USPS, um, Royal Post, a bunch of those other, like the major ones. Um, I don't have these installed on the site so I can't go through them, but you're able to add a shipping method 
you can specify the name and by default we do have flat rate so there's flat rate or flat rate per item we can then say the rate label the description and the rate amount and then if you wanted to do like table rate shipping you could do that as well uh, where you would say if the order has a total like the total if the total is greater than zero this would apply but if it was greater than you could do like a cheaper one if it's greater than fifty dollars um, so an example here let's see if this has the express shipping just says 10 um, you can limit shipping based off of the shipment weight so you could say that the express shipping sorry you can say that express shipping is has to be less than or equal to you know 20 kilograms which i actually have no idea what that is so like 20 pounds so you can go in and we have all these different um, conditions that can be applied and you can say that all or any so it's an or um give shipping payments so we do have various payment gateways and those also have different conditions that can be attached So when you create a payment gateway, you select from the various payment gateway method or plugins that are available, which all major um, payment gateways are supported. And you can also add conditions here as well. We have, I've been on several sites where certain users have access to a purchase order or pay by invoice option. So they can create the order and then select this I'll pay later option and then the business goes and sends them the invoice or charges it to a previous purchase order but regular users still have to pay by credit card so that's where this customer and customer role can be used um, you could also limit based on certain products um, i know that let's say you sell certain products and something can't be sold by paypal for xyz reason so you could say that if it's paypal you, know, you can say product does not contain types Um, I brought up the various checkout flows and I'll wait for this to load. So you're able to create different checkout flows. Um, when you, by default, commerce installs several default settings, but then when you add shipping, it ends up using the shipping checkout flow. And this allows you to customize what the checkout would look like. You're able to do a login and guest up front, and you can say if you allow guest registration or not. So for an example of the whole B2B, if somebody ends up in a B2B checkout flow, you want to enforce that they log in because you need to know about them in order for this to have any of the pricing to work. Um, contact information, you can handle shipping, which shipping does have auto recalculation now. I know that was previously a missing feature, but that recently was added out or added in. And you can handle where the coupon redemption and order summary. And I'll actually go through an order flow real quick. So when I brought up the faceted search, this is the commerce demo with the, with the Belgrade theme. So these are all facets on the left-hand side here that allow you to drill down the search even more. So if I click on Urban Hipster, we'll be brought to that category. I can view the product. We need to add this to the cart really quick. Let's go view that. So if I go to the checkout, oh, if I type in something, is it gonna pick? Ah, well, okay, there we go. So we went in and you'll see that as I made changes, it actually did a quick recalculation. Um, like if I type in the address, you'll see that it automatically updated and said it was the invalid address code. And then it auto updated. And I have the option to save it to my address book. I can type in a credit card, which um, I realized I shot myself in the foot four years ago. So if I click continue to review, you'll see that um, it shows a review of all the information and it tokenized the payment method and when i say i shot myself in the foot this is going to error out 
um, our default payment gateway declines the transaction if the zip code is 53140. I did that as part of our testing to test card failures, but 53140 is my zip code. Um, so I made it so that I can never properly test Drupal Commerce with my own address. Um, so let me change that to 5431. So you can sell anywhere in the world except for Kenosha. Yeah, well, just that one address of Kenosha. Oh, nice. Um, I'm just going to do cash on delivery. See that my billing information is the same as my shipping information. And then I can pay and complete. Um, you I, really are focusing on local business if you can't do online orders in your own town. Yeah. Uh, we a new advance or a new enhancement that might that would be new to some folks is we did make it where um, the checkout completion message can now be customized using tokens. Oh, that's cool. So we have this in here. So if I say, so now, before this was all done via Twig, because when we first built Drupal Commerce 2, like everybody's like, oh, yep. Twig's amazing. Twigify all the things. <laughs> and then Site Builder started to actually use Drupal 8, and it was like, oh, we can't do as much stuff. So you yeah, see, if I go here, refresh the page, I can now um, go to that and be able to customize this text, which... That's pretty handy. That that was a, you know, you remember when we worked on Barton's, that was a, that right there was like a couple sprints. Yes. Just configuring the checkout message. Yes. And if we go to URL, we can copy, we'll copy that and I should be able to I don't know if you can use tokens and links, but we'll find out. Um, yep, so I was able to then make it a link, which you now know my address, but that's okay because it's technically a public record for my business anyways. Um, so the user can then view their, their address or their orders. And if we go to orders, we'll view the order and we can see the items that are in the order. Um, we can comment on the activity. So every time that something was done, it generated a log. And this is an admin comment. We can click add comment. And it shows up in the comment log. So as it's being processed, you can know what's going on. Um, all orders go through a workflow. Shipping orders by default have a validation workflow, or sorry, fulfillment workflow where once it's been placed, it goes into fulfillment, which, you know, that's when you go and you pack the order and you ship it out. So if I were to go ship this, I would then click fulfill order, which made it be marked completed. And this is when you could trigger like different emails to be sent off to the user. And you can see all their information. If I go to shipments, um, we can click edit. And the shipping UI needs a little bit of work still. But if I wanted to, I could add in the tracking code and we would have it render out there. Um, so I haven't used Magento. I'm going to read this question. I haven't used Magento in the last few years or any other CMS in Drupal. Would you advise using Magento against Drupal Commerce for any scenarios? I would advise never using Magento. Um, I had never got Magento to even run in a machine. Um, and so I, I was on one Magento project and we just had issues and it, it's kind of sad for the project because it was a really strong CMS. Then the company got bought by eBay and then eBay let it kind of just atrophy and then they spun out their own thing and then Adobe bought them. Um, so it's, uh, I don't know. I don't have a good experience experience with it. Um, I don't think it's as flexible. Uh, Magento isn't a CMS, so you don't have content and commerce built into the same platform. Um, Magento doesn't have as good multilingual support as Drupal Commerce, thanks to, you know, Drupal. So the, the outlier, what I think makes Drupal Commerce stand out against Magento is the fact that it's built on Drupal. So it gets Drupal's entity modeling system, 
It gets all of Drupal's multilingual, the translation support, all the localization and internationalization items. That's what makes me think it's a standout compared to a lot of these other platforms. Um, you know, if you look at Cilius or Oro Commerce, they actually have some really strong B2B features, but they don't necessarily have the other parts that a storefront would use. So there's, there's always trade-offs with every platform. Um, is there methods to automate getting that tracking code on the order? If you use the FedEx module, I believe that will automate. If you use any of the integrated shipping methods, they should do that. Um, I have a patch in shipping that's being sponsored by Great Lakes Taping Tools out of Michigan to actually allow setting the tracking code and generate the tracking link without any of those um, direct integrations. So you'd be able to go to the shipment and then in here say what shipping carrier it's for and then generate the tracking link automatically once you put a tracking code. Um, so there are ways to automate getting that tracking code, but it's if you have one of those um, shipping, what do you wanna call them? Shipping integrations. Um, so if you got one of the modules, or shipping methods, shipping methods, and you were to go to add shipping method, then you would see under plugin, you'd probably see like USPS or UPS FedEx, and that is what would automate that process. Oh yeah, can I explain how Drupal Commerce uses Drupal stuff under the hood? Well, um, if anybody's ever written a custom Drupal entity, a lot of the developer experience is thanks to Drupal Commerce. Um, a lot of the like Drupal Commerce is all custom entities. Um, we have, you know, orders, orders and order items. Priceless are their own entity with priceless items. Product attributes are a config entity with product attribute values. Entity references, probably probably the 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 worst part about Drupal Commerce is the extreme normalization and relationships because you have an order that references order items, and an order item references the product variation that it purchased. And a product variation then bubbles up to the product that it was that it belongs to. So there's everything tied in there with entity references. Um, for display modes, let's go into product attributes a bit more. So in color, um, actually if I go here and I go to manage form display or manage fields, so to get the color on there, we actually added a color field to this attribute. And in Manage Form Display, you know, we could say color boxes. Like we could change it to be a color grid. Let's click Save. I have no idea what this is actually. So color grid is broken. Um, let's just do color HTML5. And let's go Edit. So now when we're in here, changing the form display mode, we're able to get the HTML5 color picker for a, you know, you could say more enhanced experience. Um, when we go back to manage display, this is for entity view display, we hide the name because we don't really want to show the name. Um, no, not new window. Um, let me go back to that product. So if I go to man, do this. So if I were to change this to have the name above, let's say hidden, let's click save. And if I refresh here, you can see that we now see it wrapped like blue and green is labeled into there. So if we hide this, um, color swatch, color swatch options. You know, I don't know what some of these field settings are, um, but you can even do an image then. So if you had an image, you would be able to upload that swatch image then as well. Um, so it's highly customized for orders. We have the, um, there's a module called, called commerce checkout order fields. And you can actually customize different form displays. So you could create a new form display that's called checkout and then actually embed custom order fields into the checkout. So that way the customer can provide custom data along the way. So if Drupal uses it, we've integrated with it and we've broken it and then had to fix it. Um, probably 
probably some of my my biggest grief over the past five six years of working with Drupal Commerce is like I feel like every time we touch an API, we break it or break assumptions, and have to come up with ways to like you know help work it out, such as um, layout builder. I, I didn't even get to touching layout builder. So one of the last thing, one of my last major contributions was enabling layout builder support with products. And there was a whole bunch of core patches that had to come along with that. Um, so if, yeah, if it's Drupal, we touch it and we use just about every single API. Thanks to Drupal Commerce, I've become an expert in the form API system um, and Ajax rendering and all tons of fun things. Um, anything to consider with theming Drupal Commerce? It's the same. Um, I guess the only problem would be that Drupal and theming forms isn't the greatest experience. And Drupal just Drupal Commerce just has more forms in your regular th in your day to day theming experience. But we've we've done we've taken steps to make that easier. The checkout flow has its own twig template so you can more easily interject um, or inject custom HTML. Um, same with the Checkout panes, they have their own twig. We made sure to make everything modified via twig. Um, to follow up, any nice base themes? I don't know. Um, every site that I've been on, we just ran things. There is the... Uh, or project. So there is the Belgrade theme, which this is based yeah, off of. I almost caught it before you hit enter. I need to buy that. Um, so there is the Belgrade theme, which is what we see here. This is on the 1.x version, but there, I found out there is a 2.x version coming out that's based on Bootstrap 5 and doesn't have a dependency on the Bootstrap theme, like the Drupal Bootstrap theme. Um, I know that there's actually a few sites on ThemeForest, I think. The problem is that theming in Drupal is hard. Like having a base theme for Drupal is hard because you don't, the theme doesn't control much about the site. Um, so there's nothing specific necessarily for Drupal Commerce that you would need a base theme to take care of, except for maybe some predefined templates. But again, that assumes it knows more things about your site build. So anything that makes having a nice base theme for Drupal be a problem makes is the same for Drupal Commerce. That, I guess that's the one nice thing compared to other platforms is any of the isms you're used to go along with Drupal Commerce. Um, thoughts on the domain access module with Drupal Commerce. So that's where, um, so I don't know much about the domain access, but Commerce Store Domain is the module that ties in with the domain module to say that based, if you're on this domain, it activates this store. And domain, ac I suppose, Domain access is content access for domains, correct? I think it's the same thing now. <laughs> if you if you look it up, yeah. Or or is it? Wait, is domain module actually called domain access this entire time? It is. Oh, all right. So point of a little confusion. <laughs> so the commerce the store domain module actually. You can use it without the domain module. It adds a text field for the host name and it will do like a dumb matching. But if you have the domain module installed, it creates an entity reference to your domain access domain. So that's how, um, let's just go to click their ad, cost them some money on accident. Um, consent, okay. So actually, by clicking on the select region, um, let's see, France, th they actually have it set up where it's path-based to domains, not necessarily domains, but now this is here and it's loading the French store for me. And it's all, the, all of their store resolution is defined via domain access. So it ties in pretty well if you use that domain, this commerce store domain module, and you can segment out your, for that whole multi-tenancy, you can segment things out much more easily that way. Okay, cool, thank you. The Leica site is amazing. That's that's John Picozzi from the Talking Drupal podcast did a lot of that. Yes, yep. 
we did some base consulting, mostly around just like the store domain for them, that project. Um, besides that it's using Drupal, what other advantages does Drupal Commerce have over WooCommerce? So WooCommerce has a lot of advantages. It had like, you know, WordPress does have a very strong or very easy to use interface and WooCommerce gets that as well. The benefits are actually having a structured data model. You know, um, WooCommerce it, it is pretty brilliant inside of WordPress, how they've used the post table and post meta to do a lot of things. But Drupal has structured data, ergo so does Drupal Commerce. Um, WooCommerce, the ecosystem is extremely, well, Woo, so you have to, this kind of like transcends WooCommerce and Drupal Commerce. Let's look at WordPress and Drupal as a whole. Drupal has a stigmatism against paid extensions. WooCommerce is very, or WordPress is very open to a wide ecosystem of paid plugins. So when you go to WooCommerce, a lot of the functionality that you would get out of the box out of Drupal Commerce that might need a little bit of love, you have four options to buy in WooCommerce to figure out which one works best for you. And if it doesn't work well enough, you can't do anything about it. So that is one thing. I know WooCommerce itself sells some plugins. Like setting up subscriptions in WooCommerce is definitely a lot easier than it is inside Drupal with the recurring module. But it's one that if you need to, I've just felt, I've worked on several WooCommerce sites. Um, there's a local shoe company or, you know, they, they, sell, they sell shoes. They don't like make shoes. And they integrated with their point of sale system. And the only way to integrate was they wrote a plugin, but there's no way to define routes. And somehow the theme is involved and that the theme receives like web hooks from the point of sale and imports product data. And it is just, it felt very messy. And I feel like the folks who wrote it didn't do it the best way, but I tried reviewing it and it just feels a lot easier inside of, um, inside of Drupal, there's a, there's a better data modeling, which makes it a lot easier to receive and push data out to external systems. Um, there's, I don't know if there's a public case study, so I can't talk about it, but they actually use Salesforce Commerce Cloud as their e-commerce engine. And Drupal Commerce is just a front end website and data model. So when you create a cart in Drupal Commerce, it's actually pushing that data into Salesforce Commerce Cloud. And Salesforce Commerce Cloud owns all the pricing information, all the workflows, but Drupal Commerce is just the front end to that back end system. And I have no idea how you'd even do that with WooCommerce. Um, and, you know, there's plenty of things people can say bad about Drupal Commerce. Our ecosystem is wide and I would say half finished in a lot of areas. Whereas in WooCommerce, you can maybe pay for a more finished product that you can't extend. So there are plus and minuses to both systems. And even there's times where some people are like, oh, I had this store. It's like, just get Shopify. Like Shopify is easy to run with. Maybe go to wordpress.com and do WooCommerce. Um, because they do have that easier out of the box example. But once you get past that threshold and you try to scale or you have that one unique thing that makes you different, that's when I feel like you start to hit those brick walls and you're like, shoot, this isn't working for anymore. And that's where Drupal Commerce has a really great niche fit. Um, you know, especially if you have to build a lot of backend sales systems. Um, I've seen a lot of people use it because it has the data model. So they're using it to take phone orders to build the invoices that get sent to the plant so that way they can build the order. So it's used in, in non-typical scenarios, which has made me really enjoy working on it and building it. It's because it really solves some unique solutions. Any other questions? I don't, you know, it might, it's not commerce specific, but I feel like you will know the answer to this one. When you're, uh, when you're dealing with the RESTful API in Drupal, um, what's a graceful way? I think that sometimes when, you know, like Guzzle can't find an API endpoint, it throws an exception and everything just crashes. There's a white screen. Like what's the graceful way to catch that and just handle it gracefully? And like, how do you do that? Um, so you try to do all those things in the background. So like if it's a job synchronizing, uh, but one thing that to, to bring up like the Salesforce example, 
what they did is they would basically say Drupal was the source of truth until it was committed. So it would be like the local cache. So if, you know, like you add something to the cart, um, one of my biggest tricks is there's actually a kernel terminate event. So if you're using, um, if you're using like PHP FPM in a web server, you can actually execute PHP code after all the HTML has been sent to the user. And that's how big pipe works. So a lot of times when there's like these external synchronizations that need to happen, like on cart add, add it to the local cart inside Drupal commerce, but then on the tail end of the request, flush it out to Salesforce or try to do it live. If it fails, it fails and then queue it up for a later resynchronization, like when entering checkout. So it could be one of, you know, you try to synchronize, maybe there's hiccups, but you reconcile at checkout. And this is also a pattern we do with inventory management. Inventory management, we synchronize it at the beginning of the day. You know, we try to keep track of it in like a local table that says, oh, people bought stuff, keep track of it. But when we hit checkout, we do like a hard pull of that product inventory when they enter checkout or are about to pay and say, wait, sorry, actually this sold out, we can't finish. Or, you know, just checks like that. And those are all kind of just engineering problems that you you have to just play with and find ways to just have a lot of try catches and do testing locally. Um, I did want to highlight that if you do use Drupal Commerce and need support, Centaro does actually have a support platform that has a Q&A. It's a private stack overflow instance. So if you are using Drupal Commerce and you need, like you just need support, you know, there's Drupal Slack, I'm in there, Centaro's in there. We try to answer questions, but sometimes you just need an answer. Um, they do have a paid support plan. I think it's like if you go to centaro.io and click on support and services, they have info there. So yeah, you can get access to a private stack overflow to do Q&A with that team and other users to kind of solve these problems. So I do recommend going there if you're using it. It's kind of, you know, they're, the way that Centaro is trying to monetize Drupal Commerce is by paid, the Red Hat model of paid support. And they're also launching a headless SaaS that you can use. That's like a open SaaS version of Drupal Commerce. So, so if you have any questions like that, that's a good way to do it. Or Drupal Slack, there's the Commerce channel. It's the biggest channel in Drupal Slack. You know, join in there, ask questions. We have folks from Nine Media from Avianos, there's a lot of Acromedia, there's a lot of agencies that do a lot of Drupal commerce work that are there always answering questions for people. It's a very good community. Excellent, thank you. All right. That's about, that's all I've got then, if there's, unless there's any other last minute questions. That was a good refresher, Matt. Thank you. Thanks. There's actually, I didn't realize how much work has been done recently until I really ran it again. And I was like, hey, like I forgot we did, I forgot we added order comments that you can customize the complete message from the checkout form. Um, you know, apparently like licensed file and recurring just got a lot of refresh and love. So I'm gonna be doing some videos on that too. Yeah. Um, I've, I've been away from it for a couple of years now so it's it's nice to see those new things that you also just discovered <laughs> yeah and uh um i'm gonna try to at some point uh spin up a new drupal commerce instance um we're we're due for a redesign on the old barbecue website yeah and i promised ryan that one day i would move away from woocommerce to drupal commerce and the one takeaway, I know I said things, um, but the one takeaway is like every platform has its strengths and yeah. every project has the right tool. Um, you know, I just, every time that I run into something, it's like Drupal Commerce really is the fix because I, I end up finding that one unique trait about the company that is their acceleration point. Yeah. And, you know, 
But also there's time and money. Sometimes it's easier to go to WooCommerce or Shopify because it has a low entry cost. Whereas Drupal Commerce can have a higher one because you are building your own platform. Yeah. So True. just just things to consider, which might be the case with Magento as well. You know, I just have never had a good experience with Magento. So I'll just I try to just to keep quiet. <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs>